finally sold this German sack of poo. Some other guy thinks he can make its BMW problems go away. No chance. That leaves me with this German sack of poo. And here's my problem. The Blauscheiser was a station wagon with a tow ball. Sometimes it was useful. This is a small sedan. This is a Christmas tree. This is a four-year-old with Christmas tree collecting expectations. How am I going to fit a four-year-old and a Christmas tree in here? Impossible. This car is useless to me. Luckily, I also have the king of all cars. A Land Rover. And our traditional father-son Christmas tree harvesting trip depends on this Rover. The blossoms on my invasive weedy cherry tree tell me Christmas is fast approaching. This discovery must rove in time for the annual Christmas tree collection. Let me introduce the villain of this story, Woff. New Zealand's corrupted bastard of a roadworthy test that this flogged, currently disassembled discovery somehow has to pass. Christmas. How many days before Christmas do you collect a Christmas tree? I don't know, I always jump the gun and our house ends up smelling like a fermenting forest. But let's say the 16th of December is tree day. Right now, it's the 5th of October. Plenty of time. Now let's just assume for a second that this rover fails its initial warrant of fitness test. Crazy thought, I know. And if that's the case, I might have to order something from the UK to fix it. The WAF system gives you 28 days to fix any problems, and let's assume we'll need that. That puts WAF day at about the 20th of November. That leaves about six weeks, still plenty of time. But I do need to allow for a parts order in the middle of that. So take a couple of weeks out for shipping, and suddenly the time frame doesn't look so plush. Better get busy. So I'm not going to show much of the interior reinstallation, but it involved lots and lots and lots of cleaning. This interior was a cesspit of stale nicotine, human filth, dog, and pervasive dankness. Blech. Maybe a car that's been sitting in a rat-filled paddock for years, it could be worse. But this one was in daily use. Another guy was driving this thing around. Gross. Anyway, after much scrubbing, blasting, gluing, and putting back together, well, you'll see in the end. It turned out okay. Surprisingly okay. Alright, I'm now a couple of weeks into this reassembly, and that's going fine. But I discovered something shocking. I have an oil leak. <gasps> Aside from that, you may have noticed that there are no windows. They've been missing for several months. So what I'm about to show is a quick catch-up. Most of the work on the window frames happened a long time ago. But the last video got too long, so I left the footage out. It's not important. This is the window frame story. 3 of my door top frames look like this. Trash. So I bought 3 more from the wreckers. These are the 2 replacement rear frames and these little brackets were trash on both of them. So I made a new pair from aluminium. Unfortunately this is the best right rear frame I could find at the wreckers. And as you can see this lower edge is buggered. Fortunately that area was fine on one of my original frames. So I grafted the two together to make one good frame. Land Rover used a pair of sheet metal brackets to clamp the mirrors in place. They typically look like this. So I made new ones. The only original frame I'm reusing comes from this door, which is a facelift door. And possibly the same guy responsible for this paint scheme adapted the facelift window frame so it would fit pre-facelift mirrors, which are different. It should look like this. Surprisingly, he didn't do a very good job. So I remade the infill plate. And at this point, I made a hilarious joke about hacking out the square hole, and then Rodney jumps out. <coughs> hilarious. Never mind. I know you guys like Rodney, so here's a little footage of him painfully making a hole. 
and that completes the structural work on the window frames. The only thing left was a coat of paint. And now back at real time, here they are. Well, three of them. The fourth one's over there because I put a massive scratch in it and decided to repaint it this morning. There are in fact a few blemishes on these three as well, but given that the other side of the vehicle has a handprint on it, I think they're okay. Now it's time to put the glass back in the frames, but first, a quick timeline update. My parts have arrived, and it's currently the 18th of October, so I believe that puts me ahead of schedule. The order includes a bunch of interior clips, a speedo cable, but more relevantly right now, a pair of front window tracks, the bits that hold the glass in. You'll see in a minute the window track situation is a little complicated. For the rear windows, the tracks are no longer available. However, I managed to get a pair of new old stock channels from Dubai via eBay. Now this should go pretty smoothly, apart from one possible problem. I didn't order new glazing rubber. Now, I do have a source for new glazing rubber in New Zealand. The guy was going to send me small samples so I could check it. He sort of didn't get back to me and I thought, you know what? Maybe instead of spending 400 bucks on new glazing rubber, I should just not do that. It's really this break here which is the worst. I'm going to go and scrub all of these clean with some soapy water because as you can see they are pretty filthy. And uh, hopefully that makes them brand new. Nope, they'll, they'll still be broken. I put the old window rubbers back in. I'm not too worried about them leaking, it's more the fact that these are felt lined and the felt is quite worn. And after putting all of this effort into rebuilding the frames, the glass might not slide smoothly. Which would be most unsatisfying. And here I am cleaning glass, really exciting stuff. But I just wanted to point out that only one side of the vehicle had tints. I think that really speaks to the provenance of this vehicle. The first thing I'll do is get these quarter lights back in. May as well get some of the glass out of the way before I stand on it and, you know. This gasket or rubber seal is one of the original ones. I did purchase brand new seals, but I think I'll hold those back in case I ever do a more real restoration. And although this part is available now, it won't be in a few years time. And here's one of my DIY aluminium glass support brackets. The original steel ones are a channel, mine is more like a shelf, but it does the same job. As you are probably aware by now, my Land Rover has a couple of replacement doors. And they are off a newer vehicle, a facelift model. And for whatever reason, Land Rover changed the electric window regulators. <laughs> and these older style regulators are pretty much going to last forever. The newer versions, yeah not so much. The plastic rollers that slide in these channels are just way too small and break way too easily. In fact, when I was at the wreckers gathering window frames, you're supposed to have to disconnect the regulator to get the windows out. Yeah, well I didn't have to because all of them were either broken or they broke when I looked at them. You can see here the plastic roller has disappeared and somebody has jammed this rubber, I'm not sure what this is, seal or something in here which uh, achieve nothing because it doesn't move in the slide. Now I should point out that these older style ones are no longer available. You can't buy these. or well, not brand new anyway. But we don't have to worry about that. Let's get rid of these. Easy over the glass. Because Mamaku sent me a set of second-hand old ones. So that's that problem solved. Well, not really because the tracks that the regulators run on are completely different between the old and new glass. Plus on the driver's side window, the channel has half disappeared. But that's not a problem because the channels for the front glass, at least, 
are readily available. The rear channels are no longer available, but lucky for me, I managed to pick up a pair on eBay. So that's all fine and dandy. I have all the parts I need. But here comes the difficult part, and the part I'm dreading the most. Somehow, I have to get all of these old channels off the glass. Preferably without turning the glass into a pile of pieces. I don't know about this one, fellas. Let's see what happens. Nothing. This is not the way to get these off. Maybe if they were in really good condition, but they won't be. The inside of the channel is filled with rust, and that puts a lot of pressure on the glass, making them impossible to remove. Just skip straight to doing this. I painted all of the new channels. May as well give them a fighting chance. And I'm using new rubber, it's just a bike in a tube. And at first I used glass cleaner for lubrication, but it isn't necessary. The new channels go on easy. At least the genuine ones do. The brute part ones were a little tighter, but still no problem at all. Now see on the end of these glazing channels, how there's this gap in here. And this is what causes these to rust out like crazy. I'm going to give the window cleaner a little bit of time to dry out, and then I'm going to absolutely fill this gap with cavity wax. And now, we should be able to just reinstall the glass. Ah! ah, good morning. It's the next day. Conditions have improved. Good enough to stand outside anyway. Okay, that's pretty good. We only scraped off about 99% of the paint getting it in. Rain's starting to come in. I'm supposed to be playing cricket this afternoon. This is not cricket weather. Whoa! Easy. Well, that took me a really long time. Voiceover guy here. I've taken these regulators in and out about 20 times now. It does get easier. A little bit. I recommend putting them in with the regulators halfway through their travel. I should have enough battery to make a window go up and down. I think everything's connected. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Nothing. Oh, hang on. I haven't plugged the motor in. Could help. Where's the other end of you? Okay. Try again. Are we still on? Yes. Nothing. Nothing. <sighs> I have no idea why the window isn't working. There's still a lot unplugged, so whatever. That's great. My bigger problem is that the new glazing channels for the front windows Ah, uh, crap. As you just saw, I installed the driver's side window. And here it is, out again. All because of this track. The plastic window regulator pivot just doesn't fit. Which is annoying. Because that's the only reason this window track exists. You can see from the marks that I've beaten, twisted, spread this track apart to try and make it work. And now the pivot 
does technically slide in the track, but not very well. This is unacceptable. The other track is okay, sort of. It's a very sloppy fit, so it works. Unfortunately, the other window channel like this, the one that I installed on the passenger side window, the tracks are more like the first one, even worse in fact. Unusable without a hammer. This is the plastic pivot point. The face of this square shape and the face of the round centre are not on the same plane. The centre is probably half a millimetre higher. This is a genuine piece of track. Notice how there's a recess. Yeah, because that's the shape it has to be. Whoever designed this for Britpart must have missed that critical detail, or just didn't care. Now, look, I could grind the face of the plastic pivots down until they work. Fine. But first of all, I'm not going to butcher quality, original, irreplaceable parts to fit cheap junk. But secondly, that's not the only problem with these tracks. Even if everything slid freely, they're about 3 or 4 millimeters too big in the other direction. So there will be a horrendous amount of free play every time you open or close the window. Look, I'm well aware of Britpart, but even by that low bar, these window channels are terrible. What is the point of making and selling these? Anyway, I have a solution to this problem, but we'll come back to that later. I'm a bit done with windows for the time being. At this point, all four windows are back in the vehicle. I went ahead and put the front ones in with the crappy Britpart channels just so that the vehicle would be weather tight. But obviously they don't go up and down, or at least I wouldn't force them to go up and down. So let's move on to something else. This is a reenactment of my discovery cornering. The front wheels rub, something terrible. There's probably a quarter turn left in the steering wheel, either way, when the tires start chewing the vehicle to pieces. And we're going to fix that right now. But of course, every operation starts with a flat battery. This will be a lot easier if I can start the car and use the power steering. The primary point of contact seems to be the radius arms, which is lucky because they've probably saved the sheet metal. This is very simple. The steering is limited by a bolt on each side, that just bashes into the flange on the axle housing. Winding this bolt out will reduce the amount of steering lock. So this is about where full lock is going to be. You can see there is still a little bit of clearance between the tyre and the radius arm. So now it's just a case of winding the bolt out on the other side until it touches the axle housing. This only takes a couple of minutes, a very easy job. There's no excuse for driving the vehicle the way it was before. And now, you can see why the battery is always flat. This persistent no start issue is a little annoying. And yeah, this is increasing my turning circle. But that's the price you pay if you want to run big tyres. I'm not sure I want to be running big tyres, but these are the tyres that are on it, that I don't have to pay for, so this is what I'm going with for now. When I took the original door off, I snapped two bolts off, inside the nether regions of the vehicle, which is inconvenient. Now, lucky for me, I do have access to the back end, or front end, the end of the bolts. These two bolts here. Plan A is to drill the bolts out from the front end, but that has to be done perfectly. The only hope of not destroying the threads in the mounting plate is to use a drill guide. The bolts have not snapped off flush, there's a little bit still protruding. So this drill guide, most of the length is drilled out 6.5 millimeters, which is the size drill I want to use to clear out an M8 thread. But the other end is drilled out just a smidge over 8 millimeters, so it'll locate on the stubs of the broken bolts. Okay, wish me luck. And yeah, this all would have been a whole lot easier with the door off. But I'm by myself on a hill 
and it's just impossible to remove the door without help. Or without risking bending the hinges, which was the whole reason I replaced the original door in the first place. But this seems to be working okay. As long as the drill guide is positioned right, I should be drilling right down the center line of the snapped bolt. Now, you guys probably saw what happened there, but at this point, I'm completely oblivious. I'm thinking, why can I still see so much of the bolt? Yeah, I missed. I'll show you better in a second. But first, lucky there's a plan B. The only problem with plan B is that I do have to fully unbolt the bottom hinge. I've got the door supported as best I can, but there's still a risk something could move and twist the top hinge. As it turns out, that thankfully didn't happen. And here you can see the failure point of plan A. It does look like the drill started on centre, but then somehow slipped off to the side. And I'm not going to attempt to fix any of this. I just made another mounting plate out of a piece of stainless steel. And that's it. As good as new. I should have dealt with this small patch of rust a long time ago. I was going to buy a replacement wheel arch panel but I kept forgetting and I don't really need it anyway, it's just a small rust hole. There's no rust spread on the back, what you can see is all there is. I need to fix it now though because rust and warrant of fitness don't go together. There is basically zero tolerance for rust on any of the structure of the vehicle. I don't think this wheel arch is included in that, but still, it's not worth the risk. Because the follow up repair process for a rust failure can be a real pain. Most WAF inspectors now insist on a repair certificate from the New Zealand Collision Repair Association blah blah blah. Which is absolutely not a requirement in the WAF rules. But when you go back and you've already done the repair and it turns into an argument, what are you going to do? Best just to avoid that whole situation by doing the repair first and then nobody gives a damn. Yeah. It's only this tiny little hole here. This is quite pitted around it, nearby. But this top surface is... It looks pitted, but it's not really. It's pretty smooth. I think I'm just going to buzz this little hole with weld and call it good. In hindsight, maybe I should have put in a small patch. Because I had to chase this hole around a bit and it ended up being a bit of a blob. But if I had put a square patch in, it would have pulled the metal around more. So, it's fine. I will at some point come and put a little bit of filler over this, it's a bit rough. But I'll do that later off camera. I don't want to get bogged down worrying about that now. Well, at this point I was supposed to turn the vehicle around so I could be working on the uphill side on the nice dry concrete. But believe it or not, it won't start. Ha <laughs> ha! classic. Never mind, we will continue. I'm going to take the front bumper off. I don't know that there's necessarily any problems hiding under here, but there's a lot of crappiness. First of all, this headlight surround has been installed by somebody even lazier than me, because it's supposed to be on the inside of all of this, not the outside. Cable ties flopping around, really impress mechanics. Especially when it's holding in your transmission cooler on an angle. And I have the correct oil cooler to go in here. So if whoever did this hasn't buggered up or changed the fittings, I'll probably throw that back in. Or at least straighten this one out and cut the cable tie off. Oh. Uh-oh. We're hooked up. That went well. Oh. This 
ますありがとうございNow I admit, cutting a precise slot with an angle grinder is not very precise, but you know, it's convenient. 45. That's easy. I like silver solder. In fact, I love silver soldering. Which is why I regret using an angle grinder to make sloppy slots. Because silver solder hates big gaps. So my process here is to start with silver, overheat the crap out of everything, give up on silver, switch to bronze and drop mega blobs onto any areas that aren't covered in burnt smut. Works well. They turned out fine. It doesn't really matter. I have to cover them in black paint anyway. So this situation here is annoying and unnecessary. Why the last guy didn't just go and get one of these from a wrecking yard, I have no idea. These are plentiful. Every Discovery had one. I think I paid nothing for this one. Hey, thank you. Cheers. Uh, courier driver just walked up behind me while I was talking to myself. Anyway, if you had to buy one of these, I don't know, $20, $30? Instead, previous owner thought it was a good idea to go and spend a lot more money on this junk. And I did look up the part number for this radiator, and guess what? It's sold on trade me as an oil cooler repair kit. But here's the annoying part. So he orders this, gets it, realizes, hey, this isn't going to fit. This hose is 3 8 my transmission lines are, well, more than that. Plus, the original transmission lines were formed with a ridge that held an O-ring. And he thought, hey, let me just hack that off. And then still, this tiny hose doesn't fit properly. So he gets just the tiniest amount on there, 
and then tightens up a hose clamp which is trying its best to squeeze the hose off the pipe. So two things. First of all, this isn't going to work. I'm amazed it got this far. Secondly, <coughs> destroyed $500 worth of transmission lines in the process. There's no way I have the time or money right now to order new transmission lines. So I'm going to have to make this work. So this is roughly half inch. The connections on the crappy little radiator thing are three eighths. Now, I made up a couple of transition pieces so that solves that problem. However, I would really like to get some kind of flare on the end of this. Yeah, let's try that. As you would expect, this little brake flare tool isn't going to put a nice flare on half inch steel tube. But it did what I needed it to do. So I think you can see, I just put a little lip on the edge there. Just a little something to make it physically impossible for the hose to come right off. Once the hose clamp is down here, I mean. I'm not really worried about this leaking. I'm just worried about it leaking everything in 10 seconds as I'm driving down the road. Well, I mean, it's, you know, bad, but we've gone from level one redneck to level two. Am I missing a whole piece of vehicle from down here? Because under here, I have a pig that goes into nothing. Yes, it turns out I am missing an entire piece of bodywork that I will have to find second hand or make from scratch. A problem for later. And that is the front end all back together. Well, sort of. I have door lock problems. The driver's door lock is a mess, but at least you can unlock it, so whatever. The passenger side, however, locks itself and doesn't unlock, which is a bit of a safety issue Especially if you need to, you know, use the door. And I've ordered the parts I think I need to service the original latch. So today is the 9th of November. And the little springs I need to fix the door latch have finally arrived. So there you go. Four little tiny springs. These were pretty expensive by the time they got all the way to New Zealand. The window frame has to come out to access the latch. I have to take the window frames out again anyway to replace the crappy brick part window channels. But if you don't already have the doors apart, this would be a pretty big job for a tiny spring. Like a pro. Oh, it's coming out the bottom. That's fine, whatever. As promised, there is a broken spring. Let's see if I can show you. Now I'm sure you can't see anything, but oh yeah, just in there, the remains of a broken spring. Okay, so what's going on here? This is where we're looking. This is locked. This is unlocked. So in the locked position, if this was our door handle, we pull this, and this does nothing. In the unlocked position, we pull this, and you can maybe see in here it's pushing up on this tab. And what's happening now, see how it slips? And now it misses? That's exactly what's happening in the vehicle. Because down in here, Oh, you can probably see that now. There's the little spring. And that little spring, presumably, holds this over center. So it can't 
slip past. So let's see if we can extract that. There it is. It's broken. Cool. Now, apparently. Yep, in you go. Come on. Got it. Got one half. How can that even. It doesn't even fit. Down you go. Oh, ah, got it. Oh, yeah. Bring action. Unlocked. Locked. Okay. That wasn't too bad. Brand new, genuine Land Rover window channels. Now, you may be wondering why I didn't just buy genuine ones in the first place. Well, these are more than double the price. But more than that, I live in New Zealand, and every time I need parts from the UK, I pay at least 100 bucks for shipping. And everything else I needed came from paddock spares. These didn't. Paddocks only sell the Brit part version. So to save ordering from two places, that's what I got. But there's another big reason. When I purchased these two, there were three left in stock, in the world. I'm sure there's a few others scattered out there, but in terms of the main suppliers, there is now only one left. So this is not really a solution for any of you guys watching, and it would have been nice to know that the Brit part ones did the job, which they don't. There is hope though. These are dated 2018. These aren't new old stock. Land Rover did organise a new run of these in 2018. So, you never know, they might do that again. The genuine ones aren't exactly perfect though. The electroplater was in a bit of a rush. In this case, that doesn't really matter to me, because I'll be painting them and then cavity waxing the bejesus out of them to make sure they last for all time. As you can imagine, using genuine parts, the installation was straightforward and they work great. Although I will say, the channel clamping onto the glass did feel a little loose compared to the new old stock ones on the rear windows. But they don't seem to pull off when I wind the windows down, so not a problem. Also, my strip of rubber probably isn't the exact thickness it should be. And now that the window dramas are dealt with, I can finally install the door waste seals. Now, these need replacing, but they are no longer available, and I doubt anyone is going to remake these because they're quite a complicated part. They are moulded on each end, and there's a strip of steel within the rubber to keep them straight. So it's not like an extruded profile that gets cut to length. Hopefully someone does decide to remake these. In the meantime, I'll try and get a good set of another vehicle. Part of the problem is that, because of the strip of steel moulded into them, it's difficult to get them off without bending them. And that's it. The doors are done. Apart from a few pieces of interior trim, the vehicle is back together. There was also the case of the worn speedo cable that I misdiagnosed as a problem in the transducer, which led to tapping minuscule M 2.5 threads. But all was fine in the end and the speedo works great. And then there was this corroded mess of a switch that needed cleaning up and reassembling. And funny story, I couldn't leave well enough alone and had to dig into the pink stuff at the front of the chassis. Turns out there was a dent that someone had bogged over. A dented chassis is a WAF fail, so I can't blame a guy. But weirdly, they cut a hole in the top of the chassis to bash out the bottom, and then had to patch up the top, and then covered up the bottom with bog anyway. Why didn't you just bog over the original dent? Well, since you were cutting a hole anyway, why not cut and patch the dented section? But that's not as weird as this. As far as I can tell, someone laid down a patch of bird shit. Not sure why, there is no evidence of a hole. I guess they got a welder for Christmas. But they obviously didn't get a grinder as well, because the whole area has been beaten down so they could bog over the shitty weld. Someone explained the logic. Anyway, that's all back to metal. I'll redo their patch in the top of the crossmember when I have the radiator out. At least there's no bog in here now.
Well, good morning. It's currently the 19th of November, a Sunday morning. The Land Rover is booked in for its warrant of fitness tomorrow, Monday. I have to drop it off first thing. Luckily it's been the weekend, so I could spend the whole time getting it ready. Nope, been pouring with rain for two days. I did find time to give the engine bay a quick wash, and fix the poor starting problem. The distributor was full of oil. Nope, luckily not oil. That's what I thought at first, which would have been bad. On closer inspection, some well-meaning previous owner, who hopefully isn't an electrician, had smeared copper anti-seize all up inside the rotor. And copper anti-seize being copper, spark was leaking everywhere. Easy fix. So that's it. Ready or not, tomorrow's the day. I'll see you back here in a couple of days. Well, what do you reckon? Fail, obviously. But only because the right hand headlight had condensation inside it, don't know how that would happen, and the left hand headlight was a little glitchy, which I immediately fixed. And we're back on the road. Hell yeah. Let's go.